to the 17th edition of Stay at Home, a video political education series from Jacobin Magazine. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Sankara. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin. And almost every day at 6 p.m. Eastern, we've been joined by left-wing thinkers who've been presenting their arguments for around a half hour. Uh, then we've been uh, having a little Q&A from our live audience. So if you want to participate in that discussion, all you have to do is add your questions to at the top into the YouTube chat box. Uh, we have a really good lineup uh, for this week, so I'm going to run through it while everyone's still uh, filing in. So tomorrow we have Branko Marketic, who is doing a uh, deep dive into the very, very sordid political history of Joe Biden. Um, and on Wednesday, we have Jenny Brown on how abortion rights right now are under siege and why the liberal establishment from NGOs to the mainstream of the Democratic Party are not doing anything uh, about it. And then on Thursday, Chris Maisano is going to be covering the Marxism of Antonio Gramsci and why most people who quote him and bandy about words like hegemony uh, really are confusing his political thoughts. So what's the real Antonio Gramsci? What were his contributions? Why is he useful today? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to that one. And then on Friday, we have David Kalnitsky. Uh, we've uh, bumped him before. We we're supposed to be on last week, but then Bernie dropped out and we saw to have an impromptu, um, you know, therapy session. Um, but he'll be speaking about the economics of a feasible, fully socialist economy. So expanding horizons beyond social democracy. What would a functional economy that did involve private capitalists uh, look like? What role would it have for the state? What role would it have for planning? What role would markets play, if any? You know, this is something that David's going to get into, and it's a very interesting conversation. There's really nothing um, like it as a short 25-minute kind of introduction. Um, you know, there's a little bit from Richard Wolf and, and from the Paracan guys and whatever else, but um, this is the first time we're doing something like this, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Then on Saturday, we have the second episodes of Weekends with Anna Kasparian, Michael Brooks at 1 p.m. At 6 p.m., we have Megan Day on why being a socialist but not being organized into a party is a contradiction in terms. Uh, so she'll be getting into some of the work that she's doing and others are doing within DSA um, and why, in general, socialists need to be a part of an organization. Um, so just a reminder before we go on, uh, please press the like button on the video and please subscribe to the channel. Uh, we are not doing a fundraising drive right now. We sometimes do a spring fundraising drive, but given the economic environment, we actually decided we're going to hold off until the, the end of the year and make our ask purely a, a moral ask. We're just asking you to share these videos, share our articles, spread the word. Um, you know, we'll still be around at the end of the year to ask for your money then. So for now, just press like on the video and subscribe. Um, and tonight, uh, we are joined by John Clegg. Uh, John is a fellow at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's one of the, the good people at the University of Chicago. Uh, I've, apparently, a lot of the neoliberals have, have either died out or at the very least are not writing for both Jacobin and our sister journal, Catalyst, like John is. And tonight, he's going to be talking about what role slavery played in the formation and development of US capitalism. So without further ado, uh, John, please take it away. And to everyone else, if you want to participate in the discussion after he's done, uh, please do so in the YouTube chat. But thanks a lot for being here, John, and, and go ahead. Thanks a lot, Vasca. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, I'm not here as a representative of the University of Chicago, uh, but I am very glad to um, be here and be invited to this uh, series. I um, feel, you know, it's crazy to be talking about anything other than coronavirus right now, um, but this is what I study and, and I'm, I'm, I feel very flattered that you guys have been um, so generous to, to ask me to, to present. And I'm really interested in whatever people have questions and, and, and Q&A after, after the talk. It's gonna, gonna try to keep it very brief. Um, so the title of my talk is, How Does Slavery Shape American Capitalism? Right, so I have a question. I think it's a question that many Americans, uh, especially many on the liberal and left political spectrum, uh, 
they're kind of asking themselves today. Um, we're more aware, aware, I think, today than we ever have been of the, of certainly of the last hundred years of the legacy of slavery in America. And despite my disagreement with some of the answers um, that people give to that question, I think people are asking with good motives and the right intuitions. Um, but of course, I think some might dismiss the question itself out of hand. Capitalism can't be influenced by slavery, they might respond, because capitalism is the opposite of slavery. Capitalism, as the slogan has it, is freedom, or at least we might define it as a system of free wage labor. So such critics might even go further and claim that not only is capitalism slavery's opposite, um, but it, in some historical sense, was slavery's negation, that the emergence of a thriving free labor system in the American North doomed slavery in the American South to an inevitable death due to its inability to compete economically and ultimately militarily. So this view, which I think today one tends to find really only among right-wing and libertarian apologists for capitalism, was until quite recently, the mainstream view, the dominant view among American liberals, and even had a quite large following on the left. So across the political spectrum, Americans were agreed that to the extent that, slave, that the legacy of slavery influenced their modern world, it was only as a, a kind of holdover or a relic from a bygone or pre-capitalist era. So to support that consensus, or that consensus in some ways was based on a broad consensus among American historians, that antebellum slavery was not only brutal and cruel, but also a backward and inefficient economic system, closer to medieval feudalism than to modern capitalism. So for these uh, so-called consensus historians, the Southern slave plantation was a chronically unprofitable institution, incapable of adapting to the dynamism of a market economy. They'd read their Adam Smith, who taught them that slave labor was, was um, unproductive because it wasn't given freely. And, and they interpreted the Civil War as the inevitable triumph of efficiency over inefficiency, modernity over tradition, industry over agriculture, and capitalism over slavery. So this interpretation of the antebellum Southern economy has today, I think, really been broadly rejected across the political spectrum uh, by, by scholars, social scientists, historians. Um, interestingly, the first person to really argue that antebellum slavery was in fact capitalist was none other than Karl Marx. And, and his interpretation was taken up by African-American Marxists in the 1930s, people like C.L.R. James and W.B. Du Bois, who emphasized that capitalists could be found on both sides of the American Civil War. They argued that the abolition of slavery was primarily won by a struggle of labor against capital, led by a self-emancipating black working class from which contemporary labor and anti-capitalist movements could take inspiration. And I think Matt Carp, that guy gave a great uh, talk about the mass politics of anti-slavery in the North uh, last week on this, on this series. Um, but it was only in the 1960s uh, when social and economic historians began a systemic study or systematic study of census records and plantation, um, plantation records or plantation accounts that the old consensus was overturned. So these studies found contrary to Adam Smith that slave plantations were in fact just as profitable as Northern factories, that, that most slave owners behaved like calculating businessmen and that slave markets in a cruel irony could be described as what economists would call free markets in the sense that they were competitive and efficient according to the definition of economists. Uh, on the basis of this new evidence, some economists actually questioned their faith in the moral benefits of market efficiency, while historians were forced to abandon their entrenched and somewhat romantic view of slave owners as old world aristocrats. So to give you a taste of the kind of evidence that, um, uh, that was presented at that time, you should be able to see on your screens right now an estimate of labor productivity in Southern agriculture by the economic historian Suresh Naidu, who I think is published in Jacobin. The two curves here represent the distribution of labor productivity on farms with slaves and farms without slaves. As you can see, farms with slaves have both higher average labor productivity, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but they also have a narrower distribution around the mean. Uh, this indicates that the average slave produced both more cotton for any given input of land and raw materials than the average farm laborer, and that the, the more distrib bunch distribution indicates that slave markets were more efficient in allocating labor to its most productive use. My own research, which I can talk about in the Q&A if you like, shows that 
slaves were not only more productive, but were also more exploited in the sense that they consumed a much smaller share of what they produced, thus generating more surplus for their owners. So of course, whether you think any of this is evidence that American slave plantations were capitalist depends on your definition of capitalism. But I would argue that whatever your definition is, it should be able to account for this pattern, which you should be able to see on your screen now, which is from the core econ textbook. And it's from Angus Madison's data on GDP growth over a thousand years, right? From 1000 AD to today. And here you can see five countries, um, but all, almost all countries observe the same kind of hockey stick shape. Um, so what we're seeing here is what we could, could is, is um, a, a, a clear, far higher rates of pro annual productivity growth in what we conventionally call the capitalist era. Historians generally attribute this pattern uh, to capitalism's tendency to continuously revolutionize the, the production process with labor saving technology. So some might defend the old consensus in the face of that evidence, the, the evidence I've already presented by arguing that slaves may have been forced to work harder and paid less than free laborers, but slave plantations remain technologically stagnant and thus economically backward in the sense that they generated few productivity enhancing innovations. But quite recently, new evidence from plantation accounts has shown the opposite to be true. So this is a graph adapted from Alan Olmsted and Paul Rohde, two economic historians, who show that the average number of bales produced by slaves on cotton plantations from 1800 to 1860, as you can see, the observed rate of increase in labor productivity is really high. In fact, it's higher than that experienced in British cotton textile mills over the same period, a period which saw some of the introduction of some of the uh, trademark innovations of the Industrial Revolution. And we find comparable productivity growth in Louisiana sugar mills, for instance, uh, which underwent rapid mechanization and were entirely manned by skilled slave laborers. So cotton production was less mechanized than sugar and the exact causes of the observed productivity growth have been disputed, um, with some arguing that it's a kind of biological innovation and other, others point to a sort of transformation in the labor process. But my view is that whatever the proximate cause of productivity growth, the ultimate cause is that slave owners in the United States, unlike feudal lords in Europe, were forced to compete for credit and would lose their land and slaves via foreclosure if they failed to produce cotton or sugar at a competitive cost. In other words, according to my definition, they were capitalists. So as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm broadly in agreement with the new consensus about the capitalist character of American slavery. And I agree that it's relevant to the question with which we began. So when we ask how slavery shaped American capitalism, the new consensus allows us to disarm those who would simply dismiss the question by defining capitalism and slavery as opposites. If slavery was itself capitalist, it makes sense to ask what features modern American capitalism might have in common with its slave-based ancestor. Indeed, it seems reasonable to suppose that the transition from slave-based to wage labor-based capitalism enabled certain features of the former to persist, such that we may be still living today in a capitalist system which bears the scars of its slave past. So against the right-wing critics, I think that the liberal and left-wing historians are right when they insist that slavery fundamentally influenced the formation and later development of American capitalism. However, there, I think, there is, I think, a danger of misunderstanding the nature of that influence and thus potentially drawing the wrong conclusions from it. What I'm going to argue today is that we're basically right in our intuition that slavery mattered, right? that, it, that it somehow is constitutive of our world but we're often misled in thinking about how it mattered and what way it constitutes the world we live in. So in surveying the growing evidence of um, the capitalist character of American slavery, it's easy to conclude that slavery is constitutive of our world because it explains why America is such a rich country. Um, when one hears, for instance, that um, that half or more than half of all American millionaires in 1850 were slave owners, or, or that slaves made up a huge percentage of national wealth in 1860, right? More than all the factories and, and railroads combined. It's natural, I think, to suppose that one may have discovered the secret origin of American wealth. Without slavery, it seems America wouldn't be economically de as developed as it is. But I wanna suggest that such a conclusion is actually unwarranted, at least in the American case, because it doesn't follow from the premise, firstly, that capitalism, the fact that slavery is, is capitalist doesn't imply that it drove capitalist growth elsewhere. 
but most importantly, because it, it's not consistent with the best available evidence. So sometimes we draw those kind of conclusions because we misinterpret that evidence. In a recent congressional hearing, Ta-Nehisi Coates cited the Cornell historian Ed Baptist to the effect that almost half of America's GDP in the 1830s derived directly or indirectly from cotton produced by slaves. Yet Baptist estimate was in fact based on a basic misunderstanding of national accounts. More plausible estimates put that figure in a range of five to 10%. Now, of course, 10% is not by no means a small share of GDP, but the deeper problem with the conclusion that Baptists and others draw is that they overlook that despite the productivity of slave labor and the tremendous wealth it generated, um, slave plantations also presented a, a number of limits uh, to Southern economic growth and also to perhaps national growth. Perhaps what we could think of these as, as what economists call negative externalities. So a first and clear one is that slave owners oppose almost every federal and state policy of economic development in the antebellum period. They oppose railroads and canals, things that would actually benefit them as, as uh, export oriented farmers. They, they, they oppose the construction of ports and of public universities, undermining the Southern education system for, for many generations. They were also opposed to immigration to the South, including actually the they were, most of them were opposed to reopening the international slave trade, which threatened to reduce the value of their slaves. Um, and the resulting low levels of migration into the South checked the growth of Southern towns and industry and left Southern, the South highly dependent on a number of small, a small number of export crops that had few downstream or upstream benefits to other businesses. Um, and this was also because slave plantations, they, they limited markets to other producers in both the North and the South because slaves consumed little Right? They were paid very little, of course, uh, in terms of their consumption, and they produced much of what they did consume themselves. So as a result of all these factors, the net effect of slavery on Southern economic development was most likely negative. Since the Civil War, the South has been the poorest region in the US, just as most nations in the Western Hemisphere that historically depended on slavery are poorer today than most of their counterparts in which slavery was either absent or less prevalent. By contrast, the North, Far from economically suffering from the end of Southern slavery, as many of these arguments imply, right, that so slavery is the driver of growth, and you'd expect the North Northern economy to slow down when, when slavery was abolished. In fact, it went on to experience some of the highest growth, growth rates in its history. So emancipation appears to have benefited the Northern economy. Yet it doesn't follow from this that slavery had no influence on American capitalism, as the old consensus suggested. On the contrary, Slavery was fundamental to shaping the path of American capitalist development in the US, uh, American capitalist development, even if it didn't drive overall growth and accumulation. Moreover, I think the way it shaped it has profound consequences for the politics of race and class in America today. Now, slavery's most important influence has been over America's distinctively rigid racial hierarchy. We can see this hierarchy not just in the South, where it was enforced by Jim Crow's segregation and extrajudicial lynchings, but throughout the US, where African Americans have consistently been relegated to the bottom tier of the labor market, and of course have experienced the highest rates of incarceration. The costs have also, I think, been borne not just by the descendants of slaves, but by the American working class as a whole, which despite exemplary moments of interracial solidarity in the 1880s and 1930s especially, has too often failed to unite against their com common enemy, against the capitalists. One of the most enduring questions in, in sociology is why is there no socialism in the US? Why is there no labor party, no social democracy? Why is there no strong welfare state, no national health care? Every serious attempt to answer that question has, has cited racism as a key factor that has divided the American working class. And while black slavery is not the only explanation of American racism, native genocide clearly has a role to play, a major role to play. There's no doubt that it made a signal contribution to it. And I think that that particular aspect of the legacy of slavery is well understood and well known, um, especially among liberals and leftists. Um, but also I think in a Jacobin article that I published last September, I pointed to another way that I think slavery signally contributed to the why no socialism question. So in that article, I argued that the, the balance of power between federal, state and local governments in the US set forth in the constitution upheld by American courts has played a key role in, in weakening labor relative to capital. Afri uh, American capitalists today have 52 varieties of regulation and taxation to choose from, 
This has resulted in a kind of legal and fiscal arbitrage as states compete to attract investment. Labor, meanwhile, is far less mobile. And, and the one arm of the American state that would be capable, should it be forced to listen, uh, would, it be, should be, would be capable of disciplining capital, federal government, um, was constitutionally barred from doing so for most American history. So I argue that this federal system, which weights the scales in capital's favor consistently, um, I, I, it can be traced to the compromise won by slave owners in the Constitutional Convention. Because they were afraid of a powerful federal government, uh, spe specifically a federal government that might threaten slavery and interfere in their institution, the slave owners at the convention, they fought to limit the reach of federal regulatory and taxation powers, and they succeeded. But because they were also afraid that their slaves would flee north, they gave the federal government strong powers to enforce property claims across state lines, thereby enshrining capital mobility into federal law. And this division of power was so inhospitable to reform that it took a constitutional amendment to create a federal income tax, and the New Deal had to be squeezed through a loophole in the Commerce Clause. Of course, none of this was the, actually the intention of the slave owners. They were just worried that if they allowed the federal government too much power, then it would tax slaves, potentially abolish slavery, or even worse, lead to a slave insurrection in the South. They were terrified of this because they'd recently experienced that under um, the, the, the war for independence. So the, the historian Wein, Robin Einhorn has, I think, a, a, a very powerful summation of this um, dimension of, the, of, of slavery's influence. She argues that if property rights have enjoyed unusual sanctity in the United States, it may be because this nation was founded in a political situation in which the owners of one very significant form of property thought their holdings insecure. So this is my argument. In a recent Catalyst article, uh, Adana Nazmani and, and I, we describe some of the same federal balance of power as a, as a primary driver of another American inequity and that, uh, that has also been traced or even likened to slavery, mass incarceration. Um, and I can also speak about that in the Q&A too, if you like, uh, but I don't have time to really go into that here. So I'd just like to conclude by thinking a bit about the, the political meaning of these different interpretations. I'm sure many of the liberal and left-wing historians who I've implicitly criticized without naming, um, they, they would agree with me that slavery shaped American capitalism in the way I've described. Uh, so why does it matter that we disagree about the economic balance sheet? Is it just a matter of academics quibbling over the precise weighting of this or that input to GDP? Obviously, I, I don't think so. I think that, that the kind of way that, that economic questions are elided or, or sort of not particularly carefully thought through is, is symptomatic of something in contemporary liberal and left discourse. Uh, a tendency, I think, to shift our attention away from an analysis of capitalism and the struggles against it, whether successful or failed, and into a personalized and moralistic account of politics and history. So in this narrative, slavery becomes capitalism's original sin. And just as Christian sinners struggle endlessly and alone with this burden, so capitalism can perhaps be reformed through increasingly stringent legal measures, but never redeemed. It will forever, in this view, be haunted by the ghosts of slavery past, but it remains, capitalism remains the sole horizon of political and economic possibility. And of course, if one is looking for traces of original sin, getting the precise estimate is not really important. Any trace will do, and you can be sure you'll find them. But if the goal isn't just to grapple with the legacy of slavery in the therapeutic and religious sense of that term, but actually to overcome it, then it's important to clearly understand the obstacles that legacy presents to the kind of interracial working class movement that would alone be capable of challenging the enduring inequities of race and class in the US, the kind of movement that MLK was fighting for when he was assassinated. This, I argue, is how we should understand the unfinished character of the struggle against slavery. It was the failure to carry the fight against slavery to its conclusions, epitomized in the defeat first of Reconstruction and then of populism, that explains the historic weakness of the American working class in its struggle against exploitation and domination. And finally, this is also why um, I think it's important to return to some of those black Marxists I mentioned earlier, um, who are often cited in, in, in the new his, historic, historical literature on capitalism and slavery, but I think who, whose conclusions are often ignored. Um, so these activists, they weren't interested, so people like Harry Hayward, Du Bois, James, they weren't interested in arguing 
about whether American capitalism could ever be redeemed from the sin of slavery. They didn't want to redeem capitalism. They wanted to abolish it. And as I mentioned near the start of the talk, their argument was part of a larger, the argument about the capitalist character of slavery was part of a larger argument that the movement against slavery in both North and South was in its strongest part and most fundamental sense, a labor movement, a movement of workers united against the exploitation of labor, of which slavery was but the most extreme example. That movement for them and for us, I think, should provide a model, however difficult to replicate, of successful working class struggle. Of course, there was a bourgeois form of abolitionism too, one of lone voices speaking truth to power, but it was proletarian abolitionism that won the key battles by bringing together hundreds of thousands of former slaves and Northern workers who were prepared to die to end slavery. That anti-slavery legacy, as well as the legacy of slavery, that anti-slavery legacy is something that I think we need to hold on to. Um, it lives on today in numerous working class struggles and, and we, we, we will be wise to listen to them. So that's my presentation and uh, I'm happy to chat and talk about any of that. All right, thanks a lot, uh, John. You covered a lot of ground in very little time. Um, I'm I'm impressed. Normally, we we tell people you know 20, 25 minutes because we expect them to go for 30, 35, <laughs> and it's very hard to control uh, academics. But John is is particularly uh, disciplined. Um, so once again, while I'm waiting for kind of more questions to come in, uh, just as a, a reminder, uh, we're doing these broadcasts almost every day at 6 p.m. Eastern. And our only ask is we want you to press like and subscribe to the channel, uh, not just for our own vanity, but because it helps it uh, reach other people. So we have our core audience for these lefty videos, but now that we're developing a bit of critical mass on the channel, it's getting served to, to a lot of other people who um, are used to the usual YouTube stew of, you know, unlikely animal friendships and, you know, fascism. So this is a good, a good diversion. Um, all right, so John, I'll ask you one of the, a couple of the early questions that, that came in. Um, one is uh, a question for two commenters who actually wanted to know um, uh, how your account differs from that of Charlie Post. So I'm guessing the um, American road to capitalism um, argument. Um, if it's possible, can you actually give a quick summary uh, for the, the viewership that has no idea who Charlie Post um, is? Uh, and, then, and then also maybe some, some brief thoughts on uh, Charlie's con uh, you know, uh, conclusions, even if we can't possibly be fair to him and his, his book in the span of you know, a two minute response. I just think everyone should read uh, Charlie's book. Uh, Bascar mentioned it, The American Road to Capitalism. I think it, it was originally a Brill uh, book, but then it became Haymarket. I'm not sure who, who where, 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 you, where you can find it, um, but it's certainly a, in the Marxist tradition by far the best book on American slavery, uh, I think. Um, it's, it's a fast, fascinating book. It's full of really interesting debates about the history of capitalism in America. Um, and yeah, Charlie and I disagree. Uh, I'll try to summarize what I take Charlie's argument to be. I'm sure I'm gonna do that, not gonna do justice to it, but. The way I understand Charlie's argument is that um, the, the American capitalism emerges in the mid 19th century and it emerges primarily in the, um, uh, in the North and West and particularly in the relationship between Northern industry and Western farmers. And he argues that American farmers become market dependent in the mid, mid 19th century, meaning that they are forced to sell Whereas previously they've been able to um, uh, subsist on, the, on their own, basically produce for themselves and sell their surplus. By the mid 19th century, they're, they're, they're kind of compelled to sell their surplus on the market. And that creates for, for, for Charlie a key dynamic that dis distinguishes um, the, the North as a now newly emergent capitalist nation from the South as what Charlie considers to be a, a still a kind of pre-capitalist uh, slave economy. And, and the basis of his argument uh, for um, describing slavery as pre-capitalist is different, as far as I can tell, from anyone else. Um, he agrees with almost everything I say about slavery and almost everything that will be evidence that I presented to you, he would agree with. Um, the distinct thing that he thinks makes slavery pre-capitalist in the American South is that he thinks that the, um, 
uh, plantation uh, was unable to really revolutionize technologically uh, the production process because they couldn't displace the, their slave laborers. They, 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 were, they were kind of invested in these fixed capital slaves. And so they were not inclined to um, uh, invest in technology that would um, increase labor productivity and thus displace potentially um, the, 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 their, their, their slave laborers. I think that's just wrong. I think that they had slave markets that were very available to them at all times to uh, sell their slave laborers, and they did. And also, I think the, the evidence I presented uh, on the high rate of productivity growth in cotton textile, uh, in, sorry, in cotton plantations, just clearly indicates that there's a capitalist dynamic of 2% annual labor productivity growth. You don't really see that in pre-capitalist economies, as far as I can tell. Um, so I, I, I disagree with that particular argument about technology, but everything else I agree with. And I think it's a brilliant analysis of the Civil War. Um, so fully endorse uh, Charlie in every other dimension of his argument. So slaves were, in your account, in certain instances, more productive, and in a Marxist sense, therefore more exploited in that they're simply in that they're producing more, more surplus. Yeah. Um, so right now a lot of the accounts focus on how without slavery there could be no capitalism that's kind of a crude version of it but that's a common account so in your version you would kind of rephrase it as without slavery there might have been capitalism um, or there would have been capitalism but slavery certain certainly sped up its development because if there's more surplus being produced and it's it's probably speeding up the development but then how does that jive with the fact that with the abolition of slavery, as you mentioned, capitalist development only catapults even further in the North. Uh, I, I don't know, can you connect those, those two things? Yeah, so I would, I would make a distinction um, actually between the US case and the British case on this particular question. Um, I don't think uh, antebellum slavery sped up uh, American capitalist development at all. I don't think there's any evidence of that uh, whatsoever. I think that it's an in integral part of American capitalism but the notion of, the, of speeding up, right? The notion of enhancing that you need some evidence of that. You need some ability to kind of so, show that, that the South is like dynamically driving investment and driving uh, um, ex the, the expansion of the market for this, that, or the other. And I think that so far, at least, we haven't seen that evidence from, from the historians who are making that claim. But the irony is I think those historians are, are essentially transposing onto the US case an argument that Eric Williams makes about the Caribbean. There's a much more convincing argument. So Eric Williams is talking not about the 19th century, he's talking about the 18th century, and he's talking about the 18th century Atlantic economy. And basically Eric Williams is claiming that the combined effect of not only the raw materials produced by slaves, but the profits of the slave trade, and most importantly, the, the markets, I think, that the, the Caribbean slave uh, islands gave to, North, to British industrialists, the combined effect of all of these things basically gave a huge stimulus to British industrialization. And I think that's pretty, pretty clear, that's pretty obvious. Um, at, at least since, since Williams wrote, has written, wrote, wrote that book in the 1930s, Capitalism and Slavery, we've consistently found strong support that British industrialization was, in, to some extent, not entirely, but was what was stimulated by uh, that that having that access to uh, a, a, an enslaved population uh, that was a, both producing cheaply, cheap raw materials and, and consuming uh, the output of British industry in the, 19th, in the 18th century. But, but Williams, I don't think, would have agreed with the attempt to extend um, his own argument to the 19th century US and the relationship between the, the South and the North. And certainly, none of the care, careful empirical analysis that Williams has given and that many of his uh, followers have since done. None of that has been carried on, carried out in the US case. Um, what we do see in the US case, I think, is quite the contrary, that just as Britain, in, in Williams's terms, freed itself from dependency on slave-based agriculture in the 19th century, according to Williams, I think that northern industrialization was largely independent of southern slavery in the 19th century. That's not a politically judicious claim, I, I don't think, I don't really care one way or the other, I just think the, the, the facts indicate that, that, that the historical evidence strongly supports the idea that American industrialization was not actually dependent on uh, southern slavery, despite the profits, right, despite the 
capitalist character of southern slavery, despite the fact, in fact, that southern slavery was in some sense, you know, uh, uh, compared to other countries, you know, one of the high, saw some of the highest growth rates of income of GDP uh, in the world, but it was still lagging significantly behind northern uh, GDP growth. And there's very little evidence, I think, that um, the North was somehow uh, dependent on uh, Southern slavery for its growth. In fact, I think the argument is much more the other way around, right? There's, there's much stronger case to be made that um, much of the expansion of slavery was dependent on capitalism elsewhere, specifically uh, the demand for cotton was largely dependent on um, an expanding uh, uh, consumption uh, that required for its basis a, a wage labor market in Europe and in the North. By the way, uh, Eric Williams is definitely worth reading. Um, you know, he had this history of the Caribbean from Columbus to Castro. Uh, yeah. that, that's also, you know, an, an incredible work. He was a left-wing thinker and a Marxist who later went on to be a prime minister of, of Trinidad, where my family's from, and a foe of, of the left, including people like CLR James, who attempted to form uh, independent worker organizations and parties uh, that were the victims of Eric Williams' engineered voter frauds and uh, and repression, but as but an intellect, it been his mentor, right? Is it? Is it? Yeah, really it's an interesting relationship. It would make for a good, uh, a very hugely unprofitable, but a very good movie. You know, maybe if the BBC was still doing, um, still, still um, had uh, Stuart Hall helping uh, to come up with uh, ideas. You know, it, it would get made. Um, okay, one question from Matthew. Uh, how much of this model of capitalist slavery was shared by other New World slave societies like Cuba and Brazil? What divergences and similarities between them are of note? So firstly, yeah, observing what I'm taking to be the capitalist character of American slavery has, has no implication that other slave societies were also capitalist. Certainly not. Um, I, I think there are many cases in which you can say there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no capitalist character whatsoever. So African slavery, for instance, indigenous African slavery, indigenous Native American slavery, Roman Greek slavery, I also think have very little capitalist character. And I'm not an expert in Spanish and Portuguese slavery, but my understanding is that the dynamics of that look a lot more like feudalism, right? So, so Spanish and Portuguese slave owners were often uh, granted land uh, by royal decree and much of that land had the, the slaves were sort of tied to the land in some sense right the creditors couldn't seize slaves when um when slave owners went bankrupt in the in 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 in, in the portuguese and brazilian slave owning cases so my sense is that that the, 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 there are many kind of quasi feudal dimensions to other um slave regimes in the in the caribbean and the and in the in latin america but i'm not an expert in those um cases so i'm not i'm, I'm not really an expert in, in anything but but I know very little about those cases, so I can't say much more. So uh, another question uh, from Carissa Smith. Why do you think most mainstream left liberal accounts of slavery focus on the moral explanatory account and avoid um, economic uh, factors? So I guess this is a very subjective uh, question, but for why do you think one, uh, this, this, this new um, um, emphasis um, is is developing. Yeah, I mean, this, this is something actually I've just just tried to be thinking more about in the last few weeks, and so it's really kind of fresh in my head. And I've been I've been coming up with sort of indications of what's going on, but I, I really, to be, to be honest, I really don't know. My, my sense in, a, in an earlier version of this talk, I, I, I described this kind of earlier consensus view as, a, as I called it optimistic liberalism, and that. What we're seeing today is something like pessimistic liberalism, right? We're seeing a kind of conception of the the the, the legacy of slavery, the the kind of um, the the history of racism and white supremacy in the U.S. as something that's kind of um, ineluctable, right? Something that can't can never be can can never really be challenged. And I think there's something maybe satisfied from a certain kind of liberal point of view, where 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 the the the, the state is really the only kind of instrument. Which might be, you know, able to sort of legislate away these these things when the state kind of fails you, or when the history of liberalism fails you. There's a tendency, I think, to um, to sort of fall back on a kind of pessimism and maybe a maybe a kind of despair. Um, so for me, the, the distinctively pr distinctive problem about what I see as something like pessimistic liberalism 
isn't this pessimism because I think I understand it in some sense, right? It's, it's more it's more the liberalism. It's more the inability to kind of um, see the dynamics of class and 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 particularly of class struggle as a kind of um, underlying uh, 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 orientation, right? And instead, we 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 under, we think of the world in terms of um, individual responsibility, individual you know blame and guilt, and and there's a and I think there's a tendency then to to kind of um, retreat to to a position of, of of abject despair, and I and I don't want it to be too down on it because I, I think that that I, I agree with the contemporary liberal view in some ways, right? I think they are right to see the capitalist character of slavery. They're right to see the legacy of slavery all around us. That, that they're not they're not wrong in that in that sense. Um, but there is, I think, yeah, a kind of tendency to kind of moralize history there that um, we would be well to do without. Yeah, we're pessimistic Marxists, but at least we have an agent of change and some sort of vision, even if it is a delusion of a world where um, not only race, but class itself is, is abolished. Um, and maybe that also helps us with our analysis as well. But uh, let's see, a different Matthew has a question, which is, where would Southern slaveholders have invested their profits? Um, were there any kind of international capital flows at that time out of the American South? Or was it just reinvested into more slaves? Yeah, so this is another, I, I, I listed off all, the, all these kind of negative externalities, right? Ways in which despite the profitability, despite the productivity of slave labor, despite the, the enormous amount of wealth that's being generated in the South, there are all these kind of negative sort of spillover effects that um, actually drain the, the, or potentially lead to the South kind of being a drain on overall uh, uh, economic growth in the US. And I think that's one of them that I didn't mention, right? That, that much of the wealth of slave owners is, stays in the South, it stays tied in land and slaves. Most of their wealth gets um, doesn't get sort of circulate circulate outside the South. They they depend heavily on British credit, um, and much of that is 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 essentially a, a kind of continuous rolling over of commercial credit. Very little um, Southern bank development. You know, regional finance is is very under underdeveloped, um, despite what some of the historians recently writing about this claim. Um, it's it's in, in some ways it has some of the qualities of a of a, of a, of a colonized colonial regime, despite the fact that they weren't exploited by the British, they were the, they were the exploiters of labor. Mm -hmm. So there's a question that just came in from, from Michael. Um, by the way, I think we only have time for one or two more, but if you do have any last minute burning questions, uh, please do drop them in the, the chat. And I'll, we'll try to get to it. Um, but Michael asks, um, John said that his Catalyst article with, with the Donner uh, had parallel dynamics, um, had a parallel dynamic to this argument. I was wondering whether he could elaborate on that. And by the way, we're going to have a Donner on soon, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, to talk about um, that article, which is on paywall and on CatalystJournal.com. Uh, so you should check it out, um, The Economic Origins of Mass Incarceration. Yeah, so I was, I was trying to explain before that the, the particular way that federal, state, and local power are divided, and specifically the way that fiscal and regulatory powers, um, so basically the ability of um, legislators to interfere with economic processes, all of those ways that the, 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 um, the, the American legal system is kind of divvied up uh, into, by these different, into these different regimes, it has, as one of its consequence, that that um, criminal law uh, is entirely, um, or not entirely because they have the FBI, right? But is mo almost entirely the responsibility of the states, right? So the states uh, are both writing most criminal law, but also, um, you know, therefore incarcerating most people. And most people in, 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 in mass incarceration today, most people uh, are, are languishing in state prisons. Um, also county jails are another massive part of this giant behemoth, right, of, of, of the American carceral state. Um, and, and the division of powers uh, there, in our argument, is, is central to understanding why in the 1960s, liberals who are attempting to address the underlying causes of a crime wave, those liberals failed 
to, um, to address it, failed to respond uh, to a, a real demand to, to, uh, to basically address a crisis of the cities, an urban crisis in the, 19, in the late 1960s. Um, and the failure in our view has a lot to do with the fact that the federal government was essentially um, uh, the, 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 the only, ele the only um, element in the, in, the in the American state system that was capable of um, redistributing, of, of, of you know, basically investing and stimulating, uh, job creating jobs, uh, uh, taxing and redistributing, uh, paying for welfare, paying for social services, paying for education, all of that, the, the, the kind of crisis, uh, what it fundamentally required was massive investment. But that massive investment was off the table in the late 1960s, but in a way, it always is off the table in the US, precisely because the, the uh, one institution that is able, in some sense, to, 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 to carry out those, those things is, is constitutionally forbidden from addressing crime, right? The, 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 the responsibility to address the problem of crime falls on the states, and the states are fiscally constrained. And, when, and their fiscal constraints meant that by the late 60s, they were unable to pay for any of the basic social services that would have been necessary to fight crime at its roots, at, it, in under, at the underlying causes of crime. So instead they opted for the, the cheap measure, the, the, the austerity measure of punishment, right? Punishment, despite the, what many people argue, punishment is the cheapest way of addressing crime because the number of people who are affected by it are much less than the number of people who are affected by any other form of social spending. And, and so throwing, away, throwing, throwing people in jail and throwing, away, uh, and throwing away the key becomes in some ways the, the, the only option on the table for state, uh, fiscally constrained state and local administrations. And we argue that, was, that that's key to understanding why mass incarceration is not just something the federal government decides on, but it's something that all local state administrations end up opting for. Um, and, and, and that too, for, for us, has ultimately its roots in the constitutional compromise between slave owners and, 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 and northerners in the, in the foundation of the US. So speaking of the constitution, there's one more question uh, that is related to the constitution, which is, do you think the 13th Amendment's dependent clause um, is a continuation or evolution of slavery? So that, that clause is the 13th Amendment, says neither slavery nor inv uh, involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to, to the United States' uh, jurisdiction. So that except as punishment for crime um, is, is what the dependent clause, clause is. So I guess your, your argument on, um, you know, I guess the question is, um, you know, whether it's a continuation or evolution of, of slavery, which, which I guess is, is an argument made in some quarters about um, the scourge of mass incarceration. Yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot to say about that, which because I'm writing an article about it. So, uh, how long? How long have I gone? <laughs> uh, you could go on forever, really. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone was going to stick around uh, if we keep going forever. <laughs> but it's the it's the internet, and the bandwidth is basically unusual, and no one can pretend that you guys have have plans, right? You're stuck inside. <laughs> I mean, I think I think there's a lot to say about that. Um, Certainly, uh, there's no question that uh, Southern incarceration is in particular after the Civil War um, adopted many of the features of the, the plantation. So literally Southern prisons you know, are built to look like plantations. They operate as cotton plantations in many states. Uh, the, the convict police system uh, looks a lot like slavery because people are being sold, uh, literally auctioned off um, in most Southern states in the late 19th century. Um, so the, the similarities between the postbellum uh, system of incarceration in the South and the antebellum system of slavery are unquestionable. And you can still see today if you go, you know, Mississippi State Penitentiary, uh, Louisiana, Angola, right? You know, these places where prisoners are picking cotton, and and it's ma majority black prisoners in those prisons picking cotton. Uh, you know, forced being forced to pick cotton. So in some sense, it's obviously slavery, right? I mean. When you force people to work, that's slavery. And I think that's the first point, right? That yes, there's, there, there, there is something, there is forced labor in prison today and that the postbellum carceral system looked a lot like slavery. 
It looked a lot like slavery, but it wasn't really slavery, right? It wasn't a continuation of plantation slavery. It was not the exploitation of labor for profit, right? The, the, the prisons made money sometimes, and they sometimes, you know, they certainly, they tried to make them pay for themselves, but they weren't fundamentally about driving uh, uh, wealth accumulation. The, you know, the difference between a system in which you know, 90, 95% of the African-American population in the South is enslaved in 1860. Less than a tenth of 1% of the African-American population is in the convict labor system in 1880. Those are not comparable in any sense, right? In, in terms of scale, right? They're, co they're comparable in terms of the, 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 what, they look, what these places look like, right? The convict labor camps, the chain gang, um, and, the, and, the, and the plantation jail. They look like plantations, but they aren't a replacement for a system of slavery. What replaced slavery was sharecropping, the, the convict labor system, the prison. What they do is they, they operate precisely to intervene in a free labor market, right? Free is, a, is, is always an in, in inverted commas, right? But a wage labor market, a labor market in which labor is commodified and sold in a very different way to, to a slave labor market. Slave, slave plantations, slave systems don't need jails, right? Jails don't exist. They, they you know, that you, you don't find enslaved people in southern jails before 1860. Um, the the, the postbellum system requires a jail because precisely it isn't slavery, right? Because, precisely because the jail is, a, is an institution of modern labor markets that discipline the unemployed, that discipline the poor in ways that, that, that slave owners would previously have disciplined their own laborers. So in, insofar as, it's interesting, insofar as um, slave owners persist in, in power in the postbellum South. What you see is those areas where slave owners still are still in power, where the planters are, are the most powerful. They're the areas with the lowest incarceration rates, right? Because because planters don't want to send people to jail, right? The planters want people to, to work on their land, and, and and what they do essentially is they bail their own workers out of jail, and by doing so they increase their leverage over them. So that's why you see very low rates of incarceration throughout the South compared to the North. The South is always a low incarceration, until the 1970s, the South always has a lower incarceration rate than the North. And particularly in areas where slave owners retain power, you see very, very low incarceration rates, precisely because the kind of power that slavery represents is in a sense the antithesis to the kind of power that prisons represent because prisons interact with labor markets in entirely different ways. That's a very long answer. I could even say more, but yeah. No, I think that's, that's uh, excellent and that's probably good place to, um, to end it. So once again, we've been uh, talking with John Clegg. Uh, John is a contributor to um, Catalyst and Jackman. He's a fellow at University of Chicago. And tomorrow we have a deep dive into the really ugly political history of Joe Biden. Um, it's by Branko Markovic. And he's a Jackman staff writer who's written a book that is uh, not just a um, polemic against, against Joe Biden, but he really took the time to examine Biden and his role at the vanguard of the transformation of the Democratic Party from a party of capital that had a wing for, for workers to a party of capital that told workers to, to F off. So it's a, it's a really interesting um, book, and it's, I think it's going to be a great conversation tomorrow. Um, once again, we're on every day at, at 6 p.m. basically, um, and all we want you to do is press subscribe, press like. You can check out John's work at Catalyst and uh, Jacobin, and uh, thanks again for your, your time, John. Any of the works that he mentioned, uh, we're going to try to put up a few links in the chat and in the comments and description um, later, but uh, please do uh, check out his work in Catalyst and Jacobin, and thanks again.